Welcome to Always Considered. I'm your host, Spencer Thomas. And I'm your host, Julius Bichani. I love early morning surf friendships. <laughs> it's like, you know, mm. like when people are hardcore <laughs> enough to wake up early, you're a 25-year-old dude who's on vacation with all the predictive powers of the universe to tell you that you should be sleeping right now. <laughs> hey, you know who else would definitely agree with that is my girlfriend, Atria. She oh, yeah. Loves- she absolutely loves to uh get a couple hours extra of sleep but by the law of the universe yeah it is uh, (laughs) that is not allowed on vacation especially if there's a potential of sneaking in a barrel ride or some good waves in the morning yeah i absolutely agree early morning surf culture is something to be reckoned with because you got to be motivated Mm -hmm. you know you got to be up early even before really the sun's kind of coming up it's Mm -hmm. prepping your stuff a little stretch and then you know the walk down to the beach you're you're there watching it as the sun comes up Mm -hmm. in my opinion a little bit of a spiritual moment for me Mm -hmm. just because there's a lack of people on the beach in that particular moment yeah it's just you in the ocean which is nice you said the surf relationships that you get to have in those mornings it's almost like a collective consciousness where we're all on the same page we all want the same thing and we're all willing to sacrifice a little bit of sleep to get that possibility yes yeah and I th- I'm, I'm glad you bring up the spiritual aspect of it I think you're right it's there's an energy in the air and there's the anticipation People talk about how how much of an individual sport surfing is, but I do think there is that that collective aspect of doing that thing together, that beautiful moment where maybe it will be complete trash <laughs> or, may, or maybe you'll see the best wave you've ever seen in your life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's the mutual communication that we get to have with everybody. You show up to the beach and you look at the waves and you're like, oh, it doesn't look that good, but or it looks great. We're out there, you know, as quickly as possible. Throw a little zinc on, wax up your board and you paddle out. Mm-hmm. That moment that you get to the beach, you're kind of in this limbo state where people are kind of sitting there and undecided in yeah. what the decision's going to be. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost like, are looking at each other for motivation yeah. of like what everyone else feels you get to the beach and you're like eh, you know i haven't seen really a, a, like a psycho one come through and then you talk to your friends and they're like yeah i've been here for the last 10 minutes so one or two but yeah you're right it's not that good so it's kind of like this this like okay who's gonna who's gonna pull the trigger first yeah. who's gonna go out <laughs> yeah. you know who's gonna be the guinea pig uh-huh like when in doubt paddle out you yes. know it's uh it's always good get in the water at any time of the day, even if it's just a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, there are times when it is beneficial where you kind of take a, a second go, you know what, this session's not as good right now. It could be better later. I'm going to go do something else. But that's a rarity. <laughs> I definitely agree that coming together on the beach with people and it's having a surf session. But then my favorite thing is the post surf download. Uh-huh. I would say, <laughs> yeah, the recap. You know, I don't know if you experienced that. Like when you film, you get to relive that moment, right? You mm-hmm. see a wave that you watched in present time. Yeah, and you're like, wow, that was spectacular. That was a great wave. Mm-hmm. And then you know that moment's gone, but because you have a video of it also that surfer that experienced it gets to come in and kind of have a chat with you or yeah. <laughs> just you know it's just like they're reliving that energy and uh-huh. uh, it's fun to be around i, I love that I, I think like out of anything for me especially in Dominical, my hometown surfing with the ogs and people that have been around for a while it's post surf download that recap mm-hmm. dude, that sports center ESPN, you know, the top 10. You're like, yeah. oh, that one was sick, you know, you got a sick one. And I, yeah. I just love the frothing energy. Yes. Yeah. And I guess that's where the individual sport of surfing then becomes a communal activity again. Yes, absolutely. It's a dog eat dog world out there in that surf community where fending for yourself in that way where you're trying to catch the wave that's going to make your session mm-hmm. most special. But you have a pretty unique 
surf history, I imagine you spent a lot of time growing up in Costa Rica. Was that time split between California or what did that look like growing up? I'm not from California originally. I was born in Idaho Mm -hmm. and lived in the mountains and was a lake kid. I was behind boat a lot of my childhood. Mm -hmm. Lived in Idaho from being born until I was about 11. And then my parents had the the best idea I think they've ever had was to move down to Costa Rica. I'm like one of eight kids. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my older siblings were already in college kind of doing their things. It was like the last last five of us out of the eight that Mm -hmm. moved down there. So I went to public school in Costa Rica to learn Spanish. I never had surfed before, Mm -hmm. before moving down to Costa Rica. So once I landed, I actually didn't like surfing. When mm-hmm. I first started, it wasn't really for me. I was more into football or soccer. That's what I was doing in the States. And I was really competitive in that mm-hmm. sector. So I was seeking that when I got to Costa Rica. But I realized the competitive level of play yep. wasn't up to the standards. When I went to Costa Rica and wanted to play soccer in a high level, you had to live in the city. Gotcha. in order to get yep. that level of, of play. Mm-hmm. My older brother was in the same high school as me, just, you know, a different grade. And he was surfing with this kid named Simon, this French kid that lived down the road from us. And they were avid surfers going a lot. He had a car. So Andrew, my brother, would go often and he was getting better and better. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn, like I'm watching my older brother getting to surf and I'm playing soccer. And I was like, I kind of want to surf. You know, I was I I was sensing this like competitive fire within me that I wanted to be as good as my older brother. Mm-hmm. That's when I kind of turned on the the gas for me was I got my first fiberglass mm-hmm. shortboard. When I think I was about 13, that's really when I just, I really started surfing a lot. Mm-hmm. My parents really gave me a lot of freedom when I was a kid, beneficial for my surfing. And then also just growing up quickly down in Costa Rica. It's like I had a motorbike with a surf rack on it and I would leave from my parents' house down the hill in Ojo Chal, a 10, 15 minute dirt ride to the bottom of the hill. Mm-hmm. And then I would park my bike, have some colones, you know, yeah. <laughs> and get on the public bus from Ojo Chal and drive into Vita or Dominical if I wanted to go all the way there. Oh, wow. And I would surf and then I would get on the next bus or whenever the next bus was and come back home. Uh-huh. So That's that was, commitment. You know, that was my daily routine. Like, as often as I could. Mm-hmm. Another huge influence on, on my surfing was Esteban. This was a friend of mine growing up in a escuela, you know, colegio. And he surfed and he went to school with me. He was like a kid that kind of put me under his wing, was like, hey, you're going to come surf with me, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, let's go surf. He lived in Bahia. So the way that I surfed often was like Chaman and Flutterby area, you know? So that wave is... The paddle out is absolutely brutal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a yeah. it's elongated beach break. It, it gets swell, but it's it's a good long wave, so you kind of get longer rides. Yeah. And Esteban and I, with all the kids from Escuela, we surfed together, and that was like a real push of motivation for me. Mm-hmm. Was like, you know, kids my age surfing a lot. Yeah, it just kind of went up from there. I surfed as much as possible within Costa Rica. I actually lived there for four and a half years with out going back to the US. Mm -hmm. So I just was in public school, was surfing every day. And then what happened that really kind of took my surfing to another level was I met, I would say my younger brother, not by blood, but just by heart, you know, and his name is Sam Reedy, Mm -hmm. Samuel Reedy. And he's an absolute legend. His family are amazing people. Uh, His mom, Heather, Mama H and his dad, Derek. Sam is the Costa Rican national champ for men's and he's 20 years old. He's won it now three times, Mm -hmm. I believe, if I'm not mistaken. But he's born like born in the U.S., grew up in Costa Rica, in Dominical, same as me. Having Dominical as like that training ground, we surfed together every day. And his mom saw that, oh, Sam's an only child. He kind of needs a brotherly influence. Mm-hmm. They pretty much kidnapped me from my family <laughs> and uh, and just had me live with them pretty much. Yeah. Like I was going to school, but they also had property in Pavones. And that's kind of where oh, wow. my surfing was able to jump mm-hmm. was 
any swell that was on the radar that was too big for the beach breaks, we would go down there. If it was like a three-day swell, we'd still go down for three days and mm-hmm. just maximize our surf time. Yep. I mean, when you surf a world-class point break on your backside, you should, I mean, you should get good, mm-hmm. you know, or at least better quickly. Yeah. That's kind of where it took off for me. And I loved, I loved the aspect of where my wakeboarding knowledge came into play, mm-hmm. where by grabbing the rope and you pull outside and then you lean in and really grab and pull on the boat with the rope mm-hmm. and you're going to hit the wake, it's kind of a similar motion as a backside snap where you're mm. turning your, your body motion towards the lip line and then you're hitting this wake as hard as you can. Um, and that's one thing that I really enjoyed when I was a kid hitting the wake and jumping yep. as, mu- as far as I could over. Mm-hmm. But now I was releasing all that power, winding up and hitting the lip. I love surfing as much as I, as I can and having Costa Rica as like a home base yep. occasionally to go back to is... Mm-hmm is just very happy and you know i have to give tribute to the people that helped me get to where i'm at yeah um, especially like the mentors and the older generation that taught me how to barrel ride how to take off on steeper waves you know him yeah uh, he was good friends with carlitos like andrew webster mm-hmm. andrew webster like a legend of all legends you know passed down a ton of knowledge to me when i was a grom you know when i was a mm-hmm. kid i was growing up i was 15 16 maybe and his wife, Janini, needed a surf instructor for their school, Dominical Wave Rider. Mm-hmm. And I was in town being a little rug rat, you know. I was just <laughs> running around causing havoc, just being a, just a naughty kid, partying, drinking. They saw a potential in me where they said, hey, like, you can come and work for us, be a surf guide or surf instructor here in Dominical. I was young. I, I didn't know what that was. Andrew was an Encinitas or San Diego Encinitas permanent lifeguard, mm-hmm. a senior guard for the lifeguard service for Encinitas. And his water knowledge and waterman skills were second to none. Mm-hmm. He had taught me so many things growing up within how to read rips, how to read beach breaks, know what to expect when it's a rescue and not a rescue. Mm-hmm. Just so much surf knowledge as well as lifeguarding waterman skills. I would have never learned right. if it wasn't for him. Mm-hmm. So I have to give that thanks because I'm in my position as a San Diego lifeguard with the city mm-hmm. in that regard because of him. You know, I had an opportunity later in life to try out and work for the city without his knowledge and also motivation Mm -hmm. gave me i wouldn't be where i'm at today those moments i i I like to think about getting to know you too down in dominical was really nice carlitos andrew jeff these older guys that have been around in the town for longer than i've been there Mm -hmm. is just like wow this is rad you know that culture that surf culture Mm -hmm. is still present and i'm just appreciative of it Mm -hmm. okay i love that that's you have such an amazing story thank you very much fun to relive it you know um Mm -hmm. and talk about how it all came to be and and Mm -hmm. where i'm at now yeah so just looking back at it and giving thanks to the crew that really has changed my life Mm -hmm. Uh, so, is, is is fun. I, I like that term waterman because I, I do think, yeah, you don't seem like you're just a surfer. Yeah, there's this broader category of waterman, which is you're talking about all the, yeah, that the rescue aspect of it, the uh, the different water sports. You you did toe in surfing. You were uh, you were talking about you getting into foiling. Mm, so yes. So as as you're developing as this waterman, and you're you know you're 25. Your, where do you see where do you see that going? Where do you, where do you want it to go? Oh, that's a great question. So with the waterman aspect of like where I'm at, and and there's always room for growth. You know, like pushing your limits mm-hmm. and being comfortable in scary situations and big surf or even small surf. Just like you said, the rescue aspect of of being in the ocean. I think that is one of the strongest lessons that you can have being able to get yourself out of scary situations in the ocean because mm-hmm. it happens so fast. Yeah. The knowledge that you gain is always going to be passed down to younger generations that are around the ocean. So I think that's huge to have. But with me growing up and creating this lifestyle where I will always live by the water and always be by the ocean, mm-hmm. it's just how can I 
live a life where there is not a moment in during my day where I have no excuse not to get in the water. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the biggest thing is with that is regarding the rescue side, but just your personal enjoyment of let's give a, an example. The surf is great. You paddle out. You have a wonderful surf session. All right. It's small and glassy and not a lot of surf. Mm-hmm. All right. You free dive and you go fishing and mm-hmm. you go for spearing. So you're practicing your breath holding. You're practicing underwater just control and depth and your lung capacity. That in its own own right is a beautiful thing mm-hmm. with free diving. And that has really grown on me in the recent years because I started scuba diving a few years ago and that was one aspect of my job with the city of San Diego is they have tuition reimbursement and they pay for you to go through courses that will be beneficial for your your career. Um, mm-hmm. Let's say PADI certification, your EMT, cliff rescue, all these things that you're going to use in your day to day. But for me, being underneath the water was just special. And my partner, Atria, she's an avid diver as well. So we came together on that front where she was a bigger spear than I am. She was into free diving and lobster diving and it was just a uh, fire that I hadn't been around. Mm-hmm. So that was so fun to get to know and practice and push your limits with your skill. Like you have this skill set that you think you have mm-hmm. and then you get to tr- put it on trial. And each and every time you notice small things that your body limits you for, but mm-hmm. you know that there's, it's only a limit within your own mind Mm -hmm. and you always can jump to that next level yep and it might take a little bit within surfing right like you're like okay i want to do airs or i want to get barreled on bigger waves and it's like okay you start on ground one and you just slowly tick at it and it will happen i just was i had this mental thought of okay what way can i be in the water at all times of the day and it's Mm -hmm. surf's good you paddle out small and flat you go swim for fish or go for a free dive and look around it's small and not a lot of energy meat there's a bit of waves and you bring out the prune foil you yeah. go for you go for the foil and that's new to me that's i've been doing foiling since i started guiding in the at, at fiji and mm-hmm. just because you have Nemotu lefts, which is a really nice reef break for a uh, left-hander that breaks right off the island mm-hmm. But at a high tide, there's a nice, beautiful uh, kind of a small ripple wave that breaks all the way to shore. So it's almost like small reef bumps. Mm. So you can catch the wave outside on the reef, but because of the collective energy that's coming to shore, you just can hide your foil all the way around that area. So it's yeah. like a foil playground. Mm-hmm. And all the other guides that I was working with were avid foilers. So I just kind of got the bug right away and as the saying goes with foiling, if it's two foot and onshore, it feels like six foot and offshore. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's how I, I like that's that. how I feel on the foil, you know? Mm-hmm. Like it could be it could be sloppy garbage. You out you're out there with this high volume board, you catch the wave early, you almost like boogie into it, and you're up on foil and there's zero resistance. Mm-hmm. You're going as fast as you possibly can on a board. It's another fun thing to do that I just absolutely love. Mm-hmm. But the other thing with that is kite surfing and kite surfing um, allowed me to be humbled in so many aspects because it is hard and I'm not very good at it. <laughs> and, uh, you have to read the wind. It's not only you're reading the water and current, mm-hmm. but then you're dealing with this harness and lines strapped in board or strapless. Yep. That's something that's uh, really fun. If you have this, I don't, I don't know if you do. Your favorite wave or your favorite surf session? Favorite surf session or favorite wave? I would say in this past year was the most like monumental surf period in my life because mm-hmm. I got a job running a surf resort in the Maldives. Mm-hmm. Atri and I went to the Maldives to run a surf resort and work for an Australian-based surf guide company called Tropic Surf. Mm-hmm. So I had been living in San Diego the previous years, working as a lifeguard and then doing offset guiding either in Costa Rica, maybe Fiji and the Motu, but only for short term contracts as Mm -hmm. in two weeks or X, Y, Z. But this was going to be a long haul. So we went over there. We packed up our lives, got a storage unit. I left my car and we went. 
we went to the Maldives. We went through a beautiful month-long training that was hard, but also, you know, it was like setting us up for success. Mm-hmm. And then we were on the ground running. So we were in the North Mali Atoll near some of the famous waves in the Maldives, as in Sultans, Honkies, Cokes, and that area. I was very fortunate to be there during swell season or uh, the kickoff of swell season and see all the waves light up. Mm-hmm. And I mean, when you are over in a where like a place like that, where perfect reef break, warm water, and potentially consistent surf, man, it is just so fun to be around yeah. to see wide open crystal blue, crystal blue barrels. Mm-hmm. That was just a few months of really enjoyable time for me where I was honing in on my barrel riding skills. I had travels within that contract Mm -hmm. and that was so amazing where we were at the resort and all of a sudden May comes around and I was thinking, okay, we're going to work through June and July and the resort goes, hey, we're doing renovations. All the third party contractors can leave. We don't need you on site right now. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, I talked to my boss. He was like, we had not, we don't know, we didn't know about this. Jesus. Like, uh, okay, so what do we do now? And he was like, well, if you want, we can get you subbed into a different resort. Mm. And I had money saved up at this point where I was like, you know what? I'm already on the other side of the world. Why don't I just go fly to Indonesia? It's mm. like June, July swell season. Why don't I go to Indo? And that's kind of where my story starts with, best surf session of my life okay we went to indo we flew from maldives to thailand and then thailand to bali Mm -hmm. and you have uluwatus you have padang padang you have temples you have yin yangs you have all these waves within the phuket and the phuket is a a world surf destination where there's a ton of surfers the lineup is is hard to navigate I grew up in Dominical where I surfed with only four to five people. Mm-hmm. And, yep. you know, I looked, <laughs> I look at somebody down the beach or down on the other side of the rip. And when they come close to me or want to surf the same peak, I'm like, Hey bro, you want to grab hands and sing Kumbaya? Like go over there, you yeah. know? <laughs> surf, surf, surf your own waves. Like let me do me. When you're surfing other waves where it's really congested, it kind of gets me a little like ah mm-hmm. rattled yeah. occasionally. Mm-hmm. So I seeked a wave within Indo that I've always wanted to surf since I was a kid. I am a forehand. I'm a I'm a regular footed surfer, and there's been one wave on my mind since I was probably 15 years old, and that was Neos. And Neos is in Sumatra or Ganusatoli is the island. And I saw a big south swell coming in, and it was straight south, like 180, almost like 175 degree. And I was like, that's going to be an all-time swell for Neos. Mm-hmm. And I had, already, I already had friends staying there, and they were like, yeah, it's going to be good. You should come. So I packed up my bags, bought flights. Atri and I sent it to Neos with an undecided itinerary of how long we were going to be there. Mm-hmm. Bali, Jakarta, Jakarta, Medan, Medan to Gnosutoli. So mm-hmm. it takes a, a full day to fly there. You get to Gnosutoli, a three-hour drive to the coast of Neos. We show up right as the swell is starting to come in and pulse with some solid sets. Neos, it's a small takeoff. It's a right-hand slab, and it just goes below sea level. A magic wave, you just watch this energy suck out from the bay and the reef will go dry. Mm-hmm. So you just watch the coastline, you know, draw all the water out. It just detonates on this point of the reef. Mm-hmm. So the takeoff zones, uh, you know, technically pretty small if you want to get backdooring the wave when you get into it behind the barrel and lock in as the wave hits the reef. Mm-hmm. The session that I had was pretty magic where I woke up in the morning, it was stormy. And I said, oh, man, I just want to get the, the first wave jitters out. You know, I want to paddle out and just feel the energy of the ocean of the biggest day of the swell. And I paddle out. And the cool thing about Mios is the reef is set up where there's a keyhole at the top of the wave. But they have made it where they put concrete tile all the way to the edge of the keyhole. So when you're walking at high tide, 
you're not walking on bony sharp reef you're mm-hmm. walking on these perfectly labeled almost like rised concrete okay well, what's a keyhole that's where you can where you can access you can paddle out in an easy way or like yeah so like within every reef break that you're going to surf first-hand knowledge is finding the keyhole mm-hmm. and keyholes are within the reef and usually where the energy comes in the keyhole holds the energy and then pulls it back out okay so gotcha. there's a little bit of a, like a channel yeah. that has on each reef that you can find especially when you're paddling from shore it's mm-hmm. like it's always there from shore it's extremely helpful because if you paddle in or some other place you might just get absolutely detonated yeah that's part of learning when you surf a reef break is finding those nice channels to make yourself paddle out easy okay so they have these tile walkway for the yeah, keyhole yes yeah, so those these tile walkway so it's just like you know it's set up for success or you get to the edge of the reef here comes a little swell and then you jump into the water mm. and then the, essentially with neos is you can get into the water with the with dry hair you can literally yeah. paddle to the top of, <laughs> you can paddle to the top of the wave and catch a wave with dry hair and get spat out of the barrel that's it so it's like you know it's <laughs> luck of the draw but you, you can definitely make it work yeah and that day i surfed in the morning and like crazy wind comes in like offshore side shore mm-hmm. windy rain so everybody that was in the lineup at the time was like oh it's blown gets in so it's two people else out <laughs> one other two other guys and i i'm looking at him and i have my gopro in my mouth kind of doing the pov shot and i take my gopro out look at the guys and i go this is the moment we realize that it's about to turn on and we're the only ones out here yeah and they look at me and they go yep and i go we got to capitalize because we're only going to have a short window of how good it gets before everyone else realizes it yeah and then piles out <laughs> and that was what happened within 15 minutes the wind blew off it turned offshore it went glassy and there was still dark out. It was like still dark and gray. Mm-hmm. And Neos was like almost like a dark green, beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I sat out there with these guys and we were just gracefully taking turns. He would go and it was my turn. And I would just scoop as deep as I could because there was no one challenging me for the wave. Mm-hmm. So I could just paddle when I wanted to and get into it. And then it's just a roll into the bottom. And you see this eight foot, 10 foot wave stack up on the reef and you just you just stand there maybe you get a little tight if depending on how the wave breaks mm-hmm. and then it just boom you lock into these barrels get spat out into the channel and then however fast you can paddle back to the lineup <laughs> is the race so it was just a a day of days really mm-hmm. like that whole session i ended up surfing for about two hours and a half in the morning mm-hmm. And getting really incredible, like locking, like time lock, you know, and how I, one thing that I I would love to say is I feel like barrel riding, being inside the tube is the closest thing humans will experience to the fountain of youth. Mm. I think it's the secret to life. And if you look at Kelly Slater, he's like (laughs) 55 years old and he's young as a young buck. And the only reason he's that way is because the amount of barrel time. <laughs> <laughs> like that guy clocks in more barrel time. And that's why he's young is because every time you're in the vortex, you're regenerating time backwards, almost like Dr. Oz or whatever. Okay, all right. Hot take. Then, surfing hot take. Yeah, hot ta- yeah that's my conspiracy is <laughs> yeah, the, this is the barrel. <laughs> I'm going to get censored by YouTube. This is bad medical advice. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it just was a magic day. Thank you for watching Always Considered. I'm your host, Spencer Thomas. And if you're scared of a wave, always remember, it's just water. <laughs>